The Lord be with you. The First Presbyterian Church of Washington Courthouse would like to welcome all of you to our online worship this morning. If you have a prayer request, please send it in the Facebook comments. Also remember, as you watch and participate in today's service, to either comment or click on like. This way we know that you have been with us. This will also help us know who's not with us so that we can reach out to them and keep our church family connected. Just as a reminder, the session in response to the ongoing high level of COVID-19 cases in our county has determined that for the safety of our members, the building will remain closed to large groups and we will continue to worship online only until the county returns to level one or yellow. If you'd like to receive either a printed copy of the sermon each week or a CD or a DVD, please contact the church office. Tuesday's Zoom Bible study with Reverend Katie. This week they'll be looking at Mark chapter 4. The Presbytery of Scioto Valley is providing an online Matthew 25 event on Saturday, February 13th, beginning at 10 a.m. Opportunity for any member of the congregation to learn more about the Matthew 25 initiative of the PC USA and participate in one of the breakout sections. You can see this in the Deacon Beacon. There's a way for you to uh, register. There's a link. This is the final call for our congressional meeting to be held, not this Sunday. It's been changed to next Sunday, um, after, immediately following the worship. Uh, oh, yes, immediately following the worship, continuing on the worship Facebook live stream. So it will be Facebook live stream. Business will include dissolving the 2020 Congressional Nominating con Congregation Nominating Committee and to elect the 2021 Congregation Nominating Committee. Our last announcement, church surveys are still being accepted, so please turn yours in if you've not done so. It's very important that we hear from everyone. Please join me in prayer. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us this morning. Awaken our hearts, unstop our eyes, and clear away the false lenses and traces of sleep from our eyes. We would seek your face and live. We would build our lives and make our choices according to your ways of compassion and peace. Speak, Lord, for your children, the ones who you call friends, are listening. Amen. Join me in our call to worship. This space will, virt even virtually, can still, can feel like a refuge. Together, Together we, we find, find nourishment, nourishment and strength, strength for, the, for journey. the journey. This space can offer us challenge. God calls mm -hmm. us to do hard things. things. This space can become a fountain of living water. As we open ourselves to God's spirit and seek to, to follow, follow the, the risen, risen one. one. May we in this space delight the Holy One. Come, Come let, us let us worship, worship the, the Lord. Lord.
Together, let us come before the Lord of the universe and the hope of the world with the whole truth of who we are, of where we have fallen short, and of our hope for our lives. Please pray with me. Holy One, reveal us to any heartful ways within us and heal our wounded places. Keep us from oh, doing Lord, any damage in the in world, world and forgive, and forgive us, us for all, all the ways we fall short of living out your love. Remind, remind us again, again that, we that we are worthy of your love, that we are still becoming, that you dwell within us and will lead us into wholeness and into freedom. Amen. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. We are beloved, and God is at work in us, forgiving, healing, and leading us ever deeper into our calling as disciples of the risen Christ. Believe the good news of the gospel. We are forgiven. We are loved. Amen. Please share the peace of Christ with those who may be worship with, worshiping with you this morning. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Good morning. I am not in the sanctuary in Washington Courthouse. I am in Columbus, Ohio, in my living room. There is too much snow and ice on the ground for me to make it there this morning. And yet, I am still with you. The Spirit of God in me reaches out to the Spirit of God in you, and we are knit together in the love of Christ. I don't have my robes on or my clergy stole. I did wear black and put on a scarf, but I don't have pastor clothes on, that which is usually a sign of my authority to speak to you. And authority is what we're looking at today. Authority is that which I have that gets you to take the time to listen to me. Where does it come from? In the church, it does officially come from having gone to seminary, having prayed and worked with other pastors and people of faith 
so that I could discern my call? Am, am I to be a leader in the church? It comes from having done pastoral care at Children's Hospital. All the experiences of my life reflected upon a whole lot of prayer. It comes from me having read the Bible, all those 66 books, lots of times with prayer and questioning and asking God to help me discern what it means and, and to pull from it help for us in how to live. Authority comes from deep love. I might speak with the tongue of angels, as Paul says, but it's just clanging cymbals if I have not love. It's my care for you, my commitment to you, even though I haven't met you, most of you, in the flesh. It's that commitment, together with my hard work and study and the blessing of the church, people laying their hands upon me and praying the Spirit's blessing upon me, all those things give me authority to talk to you. And what I hope is that you will grow into your own authority so that you speak with love and with wisdom, so that you act with compassion and justice so that you bear Christ's love and power into the world. You don't have to wait to be a grown-up to do that. You do those things now. May we, your church, your next called pastor, come and help you grow in faith and love. May it be so. Amen. So as we are preparing to hear our scripture readings this morning and our sermon, let's join together in this familiar hymn, Open My Eyes That I May See. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. Open my ears that I may Voices of truth thou sendest clear, and while the wave notes fall on my ear, everything false will disappear. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God. Our New Testament scripture reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. Now concerning food sacrifice to idols, we know that all of us possesses knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father from whom are all things and from whom we exist and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. 
Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possesses knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their failing, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fail. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to listen for and to hear the word of God as it is found in and through these words from the first chapter of the Gospel according to Mark. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing the man and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching? With authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts are acceptable and pleasing in thy sight so that your spirit be at work in us to make us all the way alive and good at loving. For it is through Christ and in the power of the Spirit that we pray. Amen. It is this notion of authority about which I wish to talk today. Parents are meant to have authority with and power over their children, as long as they do not betray this sacred trust. Power and authority are not exactly the same. It is possible to take power and to wield it to crush. Authority authority seems to happen between the one who has it and those who give it. Authority emanates from qualities in the one who has it. But it is perceived by and in some fashion granted by those who become aware of it and encounter it. As a mom, I am bigger and more powerful than my children. I am the one with the food and the house and the money, even when they are old. But if that is the only reason that they listen to me, my children are really prisoners and they'll run the other way when they are set free. My authority comes from a beautiful and complicated and ever-evolving place. Even with my three girls now all almost in their 20s, I have a kind of authority that is born from many years of relationship. I love them, 
I am the one who would lay down their life for them. I am all in. They matter to me in an extraordinary fashion. I want every good for them, and I have worked very hard to see them, each of them, for who they are. I am honest with them and pretty transparent, and they have seen me in action in all kinds of situations. My dad was an important authority in my life, and a great love, still is. He was an English teacher. He had a wonderful laugh. He was kind and genuinely cared for other people. My dad taught me Shakespeare and spoke to me of justice. He called me Serpent's Tooth, and I've already told you that. My dad did not take us to church. He was very angry at religion. People who professed to be followers of Jesus had hurt him. And when he looked at history, he believed they had hurt the world. But I, I knew this God. I had encountered this God as a child at the bus stop waiting beneath the trees. I felt God in my body. I heard God in my heart. I was with God in the floor of my closet in my bedroom when my heart was broken. I had gone to church to worship this God with friends. I had been given a Bible. Do you remember the way that, I think it was called the Living Word or the Living Bible translation? I read that thing cover to cover, underlined my favorite parts, devoured it. I still honor my father. I did then. But when he told me I was too smart to believe such foolish things, he was not the authority in that matter for me. Because I had experienced the living God and would never be the same. There was an authority on this matter greater than my father because of my experience, because of what I had encountered in community, because of what I had lived and read and knew. Where does Paul's authority come from? Why does that church in Corinth even bother to write to him and ask him an important question in the first place? He lived with them, taught them, loved them, and he said the risen Christ had come to him and made him an apostle, a messenger of God, one sent with the word to teach. I have been given a certain authority from the church, but it's not the robe and the stole that makes that authority come into play. If I had taught your grandchildren or sat with you in the hospital or held a sacred space while you poured out your heart or stood next to you packing bags of food or sat in the meeting with you while we wrestled down an important issue, authority grows when we learn to trust someone, to feel like we know who they are, to believe that we can count on them. You are very gracious to give me authority to speak to you of holy and eternal things when we know each other so little right now. Paul makes it clear in his letter to the church in Corinth that knowledge is one thing and love quite another. To know and to love, now that is intimacy. To know one another through love itself, that is everything. 
to seek the knowledge of love itself and take that out into community, well, that would change everything. That would rewrite how we understand power. That would heal the sick and cast out the demons and bring in the outcast and the left behind. That would bring forth the kingdom of God. Jesus had his call confirmed in his vision at his baptism. He was tested and strengthened in his time in the wilderness. He shifted into high gear with John's arrest and a profound need. He found he was good with words. He found his message. Be transformed, for God's dream for the world is so close to coming true, I can taste it. We have everything we need. Come, follow me, he said. Jesus' power in God was so profound, he must have oozed authority. Even the demons didn't stand a chance. If he said, come out, you came out. What were those unclean spirits? Had something taken hold of this man, taken him out of himself? Had he lost his ability to keep a train of thought, to remember who he was, to live by the principles most important to him, and to honor those he loved, making choices always with them in full view? Jesus put this man to rights, and he did this again and again for the human beings he encountered. He cast out demons of deception and scarcity and violence and alienation, of fear and scapegoating and blame, of resentment, bitterness, hardness of heart, a spirit of division and condemnation. They were gone in the presence of Christ. The spirit of the living God was in Jesus, and no spirit of confusion had a chance. Two thousand years ago, Caesar was clearly in charge. He had the soldiers and the wealth, and he could put Jesus to death. He gave the landowners more land and more wealth and consolidated his power. And yet, in the midst of all that, Jesus walked in with authority and spoke of the kingdom of God as at hand. With his three-year ministry, that was so powerful, with his commitment to loving God and others so extraordinary that even crucified, he lived so that his followers proclaimed Jesus Christ as Lord. Caesar seemed to be clearly in charge. He had the soldiers and the wealth, and he could put Jesus to death. He gave the landowners everything, and yet in the midst of all that, Jesus walked in with authority and spoke of the kingdom of God. Where is authority now? Who tells us the truth? Who has knowledge with love? Where do we find it for ourselves? There was a time in the church when authority was granted to the monasteries. They preserved the scriptures, they taught, they fed the poor. There was a time in our history of the church when authority was granted to the pope and to officials, to a liturgy, to an institution. There was a time in our history when authority was granted to the scriptures, to the Bible. And this is still an authority in our lives. We pledge as officers of the church to be guided by the scriptures, to be rooted and grounded in them. And yet we know that we all and each interpret these words differently, that it is not simply the literal words on the page which have authority, but it is the enlivened living word. It is Christ-infused, spirit-guided word that teaches us how to live. You and I, do not pledge our devotion to the Bible. We pledge our commitment to Christ. 
that one with a unique kind of authority because we say in in that in this Jesus of Nazareth become Christ Jesus of Nazareth who was the anointed one Jesus of Nazareth who died and somehow came to life breathing forgiveness and grace this one the spirit of god was so evident in him <laughs> it must have taken your breath away to be in his presence jesus went from nazareth to john the baptist at the river jordan he had a vision you are my son the beloved with whom i am well pleased he was tempted by satan in the wilderness and dwelt with wild beasts and angels when John was arrested, he was given a clarity of purpose. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news, not Caesar's good news, but the good news of God. Fishermen like Simon and Andrew would drop their nets and follow him just because he asked. James and John left their father in a fishing boat and followed him. He taught. He cast out demons. He healed. This man, rooted and grounded in scriptures and prayer and community, life with God and life with other human beings, taught him how to love God and love others. That's the way he sums up all the law and the prophets. This man, tested by experience, woe and weal, pain and joy, blessing and what must have felt like a curse. He knew suffering and he knew companionship and he knew how precious life is and he knew that he would give that up rather than stop walking in the way of love. He proclaimed compassion, justice, peace. He fought for the lost and the lonely, healed the sick, brought in the outcast, set the prisoner free, set free the tormented, addicted, and tortured. And those people we dare to call the least of these. You want to know the nature of God? Look to Jesus. You want to know what a human being looks like when they are true to their made in the image of God's selves and overflowing with the Spirit, who's calling and living God's call upon their lives, fulfilling the Spirit of the Torah, and is all the way alive? Look to Jesus, the one who said, Judge not. The one who said, forgive them 70 times 7. The one who said to love your enemies and to pray for them. The one who cast out anything that robbed a human being of her soul or his place in the community. The one who chose to heal, who remained rooted and grounded in love itself. The one who put the needs of people over the rules made by people, the one who not only spoke but lived truth to power, the one who turned our attention to the living God and the source of our being again and again and again, the one who walked into Jerusalem and turned over tables and had a last meal with people he loved and who wept in the garden and still promised he would see this through. The one who forgave and loved, even as the world's power put him to death. The one who would not stay dead. This one. You want to know what we are called to be in this world? If we are to have any authority within it at all? It will take courage and compassion, humility and strength. But if you follow, if we follow in the ways of this one, not only will we be transformed, but we will forge pathways of peace and the joy of justice in our wake. If we do this together, follow this one together, we will see the kingdom of God upon the earth, God's dream for the world, the beloved community, come near, take hold. 
May it be so. Amen. sing this open my eyes open my mouth and let's take this truth that we have just heard out into the community open my mouth and let me bear gladly the warm truth everywhere open my heart and let me prepare love with my children thus to share silent Now, as we come to a time of prayer, we have a lot of prayer concerns, and we thank you, all of those who sent those along to us on the Facebook Live, and we had some others that Ray Jean had sent out at the end of the week. So as we are in our time of prayer today, we'll take a moment to remember these folks, and we just ask that um, that you be with each one of them. So let's let's take all of these joys and concerns of our life to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, on this snowy Sunday morning, we come again to you to worship, to hear your word through the gospel messages, through the words of Paul, and especially to hear those words interpreted through our message this morning. We just ask that you be with each one of us. And as we have just been singing, we ask, that you op- we ask that you open our eyes and our ears to hear those truths and then especially open our mouths to share those truths with those out in the world. We have several folks that we need to lift up in prayer this morning. We need to lift up Carmel Payton, who is in Mount Carmel Hospital on a ventilator, suffering from COVID. And we need to be with her husband, Tom, who is preparing to have bypass surgery this week. And we ask, Lord, that you be with a couple of young people in our community, Tristan Miter and Gary Lewis, and their families as They are battling leukemia. And we also ask for other health concerns to be with Kathy Reno, Sharon Craig's niece, and Marilyn Ruger, and with Jerry Fleek, who is in OSU hospitals right now, non-COVID related, but hoping to not have to be put on a ventilator. And we ask that you be with Ann and Wes Cox, And we ask for traveling mercies for Hallie Wall, who is heading back to Clemson University today after a COVID scare, fortunately remaining negative. And we have other folks we'll take just a moment to lift up as well. Gracious and loving God, we ask that you continue to be with our country, with our president, with Congress, with those people who are making decisions that affect us all. We ask that their decisions come through a time of discernment and that they be wise and will work for the benefit of our entire country. And in much the same way, we ask that you be with our state, our governor, our legislators, and all of those folks making decisions for our state. And in our community, Lord, we especially ask that you be with all the health officials. And we ask for patience. We ask for kindness. 
We ask that you be with all of those folks in the community who are consumed by this coronavirus. And we just ask that you share your love and your grace with each one of us. And lastly, Lord, we ask that you be with our church as we continue to minister to this community in so many ways, as we are all sad about not being able to gather together for worship for the safety of our members, but Lord, that day is coming soon when we can get this coronavirus under control in our community. And we ask especially, Lord, that you be with our session and the deacons and the trustees as they communicate with you and continue to do your work in this church. And we ask that as they are gathering the information for our new mission study, that folks who haven't turned in their surveys will take a moment and make their ideas, their thoughts, their vision, their prayers for this community known to, to the session and to the deacons as we put this information together. And Lord, we especially thank you for, as we're putting this together, to remember that you do have someone in mind for this congregation. And we just ask that you continue to prepare that person for a new call whenever that comes later in the spring or early in the summer. We know that you have the best for this congregation in your heart. So Lord, as we continue our prayers today, we just ask all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And we ask all these things and remember these things as we re say together the prayer that he taught each of us. As we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory Lord forever. forever. Amen. Thank you to all our members who are so faithfully supporting the ministries of this congregation through your tithes and offerings. Even as these times of transition and uncertainties continue, be assured that God's work in and through First Presbyterian Church goes on. We ask that you prayerfully consider your level of financial support for 2021 and give to the level according to what God puts on your heart to give. Now, please join me in prayer as we dedicate these tithes and offerings. God of abundance, remind us that we never give from scarcity, but out of the abundance you have first shared with us. Show us the ways your gifts multiply to meet the needs in our midst and still leave us with abundance left over. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Of our every ill, words as we know today, may our healer of our every ill, light of each tomorrow, give us peace beyond our fear and hope beyond our sorrow. Healer of our every Light of each tomorrow, give us peace beyond our fear and hope beyond our sorrow. You who know our fears and sadness, grace us with your peace and gladness. Spirit of all comfort, fill our hearts. Sorrow. In 
There will be times when our speech, our actions, simply our way of being in the world will have authority, real force to those around us. May it be for good and on behalf of the Holy One. May our authority come from that made in the image God self, from the indwelling of the spirit of the living God, from our commitment to follow Christ, from love itself. Wherever you find yourselves this week, consider that God is placing you there that the love of Christ which dwells within you might reach out and touch others through you. For we are beloved of the Holy One, followers of a risen Lord, and people filled to overflowing with the Spirit of the living God. Amen and Amen.